Hi, this is Elliot from EO Nutrition, and in today's video, it will be the second of a two-part series on seborrheic dermatitis, dandruff, and scaly dry skin on carnivorous, ketogenic, and low-carb diets. So in the previous video, we looked at how vitamin B2, or riboflavin, has been associated with seborrheic dermatitis. We looked at why, on a high-fat, low-carb diet, someone might be a little bit more predisposed toward developing a riboflavin deficiency, particularly because riboflavin is central in fat metabolism. If someone is eating a lot of fat and they are not getting enough riboflavin from the diet or they are not absorbing it, then it can potentially be um, increasing the risk that they are low. So in today's video, we're gonna look at the second nutrient or the second B vitamin, which has also been implicated in seborrheic dermatitis. This is another one that I see very frequently. And so this is called biotin. In today's video, we're gonna be going through the functions of biotin. We're gonna be looking at why someone may be more likely to develop a biotin deficit, and then what can potentially be done about that. So just to quickly go over these symptoms for those who aren't aware of what seborrheic dermatitis actually is. It can present as a red scaly rash on the face, around the beard, on the nose, on the eyebrows, and it can also cause dandruff. Generally, it's thought to involve a certain type of commensal yeast, which grows on the skin and which the immune system is reacting to and causing a minor inflammatory response, which produces a flaky rash and it can uh, differ in severity between different people. Here are some other pictures of where it can occur, oftentimes around the nose and on the hairline. It can also develop elsewhere on the body, around the genitals and the anus. So as I said before, riboflavin has been implicated in this, but again, so has biotin. And so biotin is otherwise referred to as B7. It doesn't get that much attention um, in relation to the other B vitamins or in comparison to the other B vitamins. Now biotin is found in most foods. In terms of the animal foods, where we're going to be finding it, well, it is in all meat sources. So it, it's in small amounts in meat and fish. Um, the highest fish source is gonna be salmon, as per my understanding. But really, like riboflavin, biotin is found in the highest um, amount in liver. So livers are, liver of any animal is generally gonna be high in biotin. And another excellent source, a very high source, is egg yolk specifically. So if someone is not eating organs and not eating egg yolks, they may be potentially more likely to develop this problem. So if we look at the basic functions of biotin in the body, it is a cofactor for certain enzymes. And these, this family of enzymes are called the carboxylase enzymes. Biotin also um, has a role in gene expression in regulation of the cell cycle through a process called biotinylation. And it is central in energy metabolism and macromolecule synthesis as a cofactor for those carboxylase enzymes that we were just talking about. So there is an enzyme called pyruvate carboxylase. Without going into the details, pyruvate carboxylase is involved in how we are essentially deriving energy from food. It is replenishing um, an intermediate called oxaloacetate in the Krebs cycle. At the same time, pyruvate carboxylase is critical for a process called gluconeogenesis. Now, gluconeogenesis is how we're taking non-glucose, so things which aren't glucose, uh, primarily amino acids, coming from dietary protein, and how we are synthesizing glucose from that non-glucose source. So surely people who are on ketogenic or carnivorous diets, they are familiar with the concept of gluconeogenesis because actually when there is a lower carbohydrate intake or a no carbohydrate intake in the diet, someone is gonna be a lot more reliant on the process of gluconeogenesis to synthesize their own glucose to maintain adequate blood glucose levels and to meet the requirement for the body. Another enzyme is called acetyl-CoA 
carboxylase. And this is needed for the synthesis of fatty acids from um, a molecule called acetyl coenzyme A. This process referred to as biotinylation, you have biotin, which is covalently bonding with histones, which are essentially proteins which um, package up DNA, okay? They package up DNA. And what this is said to do, and it gets quite complicated here, but essentially this is involved in how well cells are able to replicate, how well cells can divide, and how they can transcribe DNA and all of these weird and wonderful things. Furthermore, some other carboxylase enzymes include propionyl CoA carboxylase and methylcrotonyl CoA carboxylase. So what we are doing is we are taking odd chain fats from the diet and we are taking dietary cholesterol and we can actually break that down to use that as an energy source. Okay, we can add that or we can use that, we can convert it into something called a succinyl CoA and run that through the Krebs cycle, okay? Furthermore, we have branch chain amino acids, isoleucine, valine, and leucine. Now we can run these through several steps as well. And how we are breaking down branch chain amino acids relies on these enzymes which need biotin to work properly. And so there is leucine, which is a ketogenic amino acid, and we can run that through an enzyme, a carboxylase enzyme, to effectively promote ketogenesis. Now, it's important to note here, on a high-fat, low-carb diet, on a ketogenic diet or a carnivorous diet, we are going to be having an increased amount of branched-chain amino acids coming in through the diet. So the more meat that someone eats, the more they are going to be consuming branched-chain amino acids, isoleucine, leucine, and valine. Likewise, we are going to have a higher intake of odd-chain fats. If someone has a lower-carbohydrate diet, more of their energy is going to be coming from fats. It means they need to eat more fat. And because they need to eat more fat, they are going to be consuming more odd-chain fats in the dietary fat that they consume. And at the same time, because they are not consuming much glucose, they are going to be needing to make uh, more themselves. So they are going to have an increased reliance on the process of gluconeogenesis. Now we see that all three of these things need biotin, okay? They need biotin. So it, on a lower carbohydrate or more fat-based metabolism, it's theoretically plausible that our biotin requirement is potentially going to go up. Now, there's not much research on this in humans. I couldn't, I couldn't find any in particular. What I could find was that there is a study on mice, and this was looking at essentially whether uh, a ketogenic diet might increase the requirement for biotin or may exaggerate a biotin deficiency. So although the study design wasn't perfect, essentially what they did was they had one group of mice which were fed a biotin deficient diet, and then another group of mice which were fed a biotin deficient diet, but the second group were also on a ketogenic bio biotin deficient diet. What they found was that the ones who were ketogenic had worse outcomes. So they displayed greater signs of biotin deficiency. Now, the authors concluded that actually being on a ketogenic diet might increase the requirements, or if a current biotin deficiency is already present, then it may exaggerate the biotin deficiency. I think based on the mechanisms that we've looked at, it's possible that if someone has a tendency toward low biotin, then going on a ketogenic diet or a zero carb diet could very much increase those requirements. It's important to note here that there's also certain genetic SNPs involved in biotin absorption and biotin transport and biotin utilization. It's way beyond the scope of this video to go through that, but essentially someone's genetics might kind of predispose them toward also having a higher biotin requirement as well. So a typical biotin deficiency it's considered quite rare. A severe biotin deficiency can lead to things like seizures, 
paresthesia and real neurological problems. Um, but that is, again, that's not very common in, the, uh, in first world countries. What we are more likely to see is this seborrheic dermatitis kind of presentation as well. So you may see some kind of a red scaly rash around the center of the face, the nose or the mouth. Um, it can manifest as hair loss as well. So biotin, particularly important for the nails and the hair, brittle nails, uh, brittle hair, and actually alopecia. So again, this is highly theoretical, but this may potentially be one of the reasons why people who go on carnival and ketogenic diets, particularly females, um, some people at least have a tendency toward losing a little bit more hair that way. So I suspect in these cases, it could be due to biotin in many cases. Interestingly, there is an immune component to this as well. So someone who has um, a biotin deficiency has a higher susceptibility to fungal or bacterial overgrowth. And this also um, applies to local surfaces as well. So this may, a, may be a candida overgrowth in the gut. It could be a candida overgrowth on the skin. Now, if we think back to the pathophysiology of seborrheic dermatitis, a yeast or the immune response against a commensal yeast is one of the things which is said to be involved. Could it be that the biotin deficiency is affecting the local immunity of the skin and allowing this yeast to become overgrown? Well, that's highly possible. At the same time, if we factor in that biotin is really important for how we're breaking down certain types of fats, it's therefore possible that if we have any kind of imbalance in how we are metabolizing certain fats, then this could change the composition of the lipids or the fats coming out in the sebum and therefore foster an overgrowth of some, some kind of microorganism which is feeding off of the fats in that sebum. So the main risk factors for biotin deficiency, um, the most well known is high consumption of egg whites. So generally if the egg white is consumed without the egg yolk, as the yolk is what contains the biotin, Egg white actually contains a protein called avidin, and this can inhibit the absorption of biotin. Now, this is most pronounced in a raw egg white. So if someone is, is, is eating lots of raw egg whites, such as bodybuilders and things, this can predispose one to water biotin deficiency. It also applies to a smaller extent in cooked egg white as well. So the key is if you are going to eat eggs, you need to eat the whole egg not simply the white. I said before, genetics likely play a role. It hasn't been very well identified just yet. Uh, there is malabsorption as usual if someone's got chronic diarrhea or digestive dysfunction. This is potentially going to be a problem. Dietary restriction, so someone who is on, who has a high intake of fat, has a high intake of branch chain amino acids, also has a high reliance on gluconeogenesis, so someone on a carnivorous diet, they may also have certain genetics and they might also, also have poor digestion. So a lot of the people who come to me generally fit this picture and they eat only steaks. And so in that case, um, they're not really getting that much biotin and actually the biotin requirement is likely increased quite significantly. So in those people, they are gonna be more likely to get it than someone who is eating a more nose to tail kind of diet. Two main organic acids that can be tested for biotin sufficiency. One is called 3-hydroxyisovaleric acid and the other one is called methyl citric acid. One of those is included on Genova's organic acids panels and then another one is included on the Great Plains or, um, organic acids test. Now I often see that the initial marker, the 3 hydroxyisovaleric acid, is elevated more often than the methyl citric acid, and I'm not sure why that is, but they are essentially um, both markers for biotin deficits. Here's an example of what that might look like from some of my clients in the past who have mild to moderate insufficiencies of biotin. So what have I found to be successful? Well, essentially, increase the intake of biotin-rich foods. So if someone can eat a little bit of liver, 
fantastic, do that every week and that generally helps. Likewise, if someone can tolerate egg yolk, that's gonna be an excellent way to improve biotin sufficiency. Supplementing, if, if, if the dietary measures don't improve the condition, if they don't improve the skin, then I find that supplementing with anywhere from 5,000 micrograms to 15 to 20,000 micrograms in certain individuals is often effective if biotin is there, if it is their problem to begin with. Um, and then if that's unsuccessful, then I will recommend some kind of testing, usually organic acids, along with some other things, um, just to rule out any other causes. What might look like biotin or riboflavin deficiency could actually be something else. It could be B6, could be some of the minerals. So yeah, that is the kind of thing that I've found to work in the past. That's what I, that's the kind of approach that I take to this. So just to summarize, we have looked at how a deficiency of riboflavin vitamin B2 and a deficiency of biotin can potentially lead to the um, symptoms that we know of as seborrheic dermatitis. This can vary in severity, so this can be quite severe. It can also be very mild and simply manifest as dandruff on the hairline. Either way, if someone does have these kinds of symptoms, then it demonstrates that there is some kind of immune or nutrient issue going on and it needs to be addressed. So just so the, the listeners or the audience know, um, I have personally suffered with this in the past. So when I started on a carnivorous kind of diet, I found that after two to three months, I would, um, I would have a tendency toward getting these kinds of problems, this scaly kind of rash, this dry skin, and I wasn't exactly sure what it was. Um, and I found that it would typically go away when I ate organ meats. So I am one of those people, unfortunately, who I need to eat organ meats every week. If I don't, then I have a tendency toward develop, developing this problem. Now, with me, I think that it was, uh, it was a mixture of riboflavin and biotin, because I responded quite well to both of those, but not one of those individually. Generally, liver is high in both of those things. And so what I find is, is that rather than micromanaging it with supplements, it's much easier just to eat organ meats for me personally. For someone who can't actually tolerate organ meats for whatever reason, then supplementing may be the only way that they are able to kind of reach a sufficient level. We have to remember that everyone is different. And so whilst many people might be able to get fine on a muscle meat, high fat diet, they might be able to do just fine in terms of getting all of their nutrients. But then some people, myself included, we can't do that. And so many of the people who come to me as well, they also can't do that. <laughs> so we need to find solutions as to, as to how we can address these problems. So again, if you like this video, if you found it helpful, please like and subscribe to my page. You can find me on um, Facebook as EO Nutrition. You can find my website, www.eonutrition.co.uk. Thank you and I'll see you next time.